So Frank, you know I'm thrilled to have you come. And I'm really looking forward to being there, really looking forward to the opportunity to, to talk with you more about deep brain reorienting and how it applies especially to attachment shock. Mm. I am so grateful because, you know, I've known you all these years and worked with you and learned so much from you. And this piece that you're doing about attachment shock, I think is is not being done anywhere, anywhere. And it's so critical that people learn from you and get this piece. So let's talk about like why you called it deep brain reorienting. And then let's see if we can just touch on some of the specifics. The deep brain reorienting part of it is, is a bit more difficult to explain, but the, the deep brain part of it is easy. Um, it's based in the brainstem. I'm really interested in the functioning of the orienting responses at the brainstem level. And often people look at orienting in relation to upper brain levels um, and miss out the key components in the superior colliculi of the midbrain. So and what does that mean to those of us who don't know, Frank? <laughs> Yeah, well, the, the basic response, for example, to a visual stimulus is in the superior colliculi in the, in the midbrain. The basic response starts there. So if we see a face that looks angry, for example, we register that at the level of the superior colliculi, and then we get the affective response coming from the periaqueductal grey, also in the midbrain, which is just nearby. And what I've found is that between the orienting to the stimulus and the affective response, there's often a very subtle tension in the muscles of the face, neck, shoulders. And being able to pick up that tension allows us to d develop an awareness of the sequence that happens. If we see an angry face, we, we find what tension happens in response to that. And then the affective response, perhaps fear, comes in as the next component of the sequence. So we've got the orienting, then the tension, and then the affect. And I've been finding that looking at that sequence, even although it happens physiologically in milliseconds, being able to slow it right down allows us to see patterns that have been established sometimes very, very early in life. So what I've been learning from you, and see if, if I'm hearing this correctly, is that when, that when, when we're reactive now in our current life, Everything is happening so quickly that we can't parse out these many different pieces. But what you've discovered is that in the brain, if we slow it down enough, each piece can be, um, we literally what you call sequence our way through it. And then we can actually, that's, if we transform it at that level, we're transforming it below the, the cognitive, cognitive understanding and below the narrative explanation of it. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. And because we're getting this sequence that's been established very early, we get into a, a response that underlies many, many different interactions, for example, in the relational sense. So if we always have a fear response to somebody looking angry, then there will almost always be a particular sequence as we orient to it. We get a certain subtle tension in the neck and then we get the affective response. And we don't know that until, until we really slow it down and put it in ultra slow motion and pick up the components of it. So a little bit how I'm putting it together over my time of working with you is that the um, 
that when Bowlby talks about the internal working model, that's imprinted so early and that this is where this attachment shock that is imprinted deep in the brain stem. Yeah. And that in or we can't talk our way through it. We can't explain our way through it. We have to go in and not feel necessarily the emotions, although the emotions may arise, but even before that to sense how the imprint was laid down so that we can then by trusting the brain's natural ability to reorganize is to just move through in a different way. Instead of getting stuck in the imprint, it then is able to move. Is that right? That's correct, yeah. As soon as we identify the sequence, it becomes open to change. And I think that it uh, is open then to memory reconsolidation, that when we identify the sequence, we deconsolidate that deep brain sequence and we look at it in a way that allows us to reorient to it and that then leads to a reconsolidation of that memory so that the sequence clears and doesn't cause us distress in the future. Oh, it's so exciting because that's been my experience and I know that as we've talked about it over the time that it really is this change at the at a really I was going to say a meta level, but it's more like a, a I don't know what it is. It, that it's the brainstem. That's what you're trying to say. It's that, that deep level that just reorganized. So, and if I could just add that, um, what doesn't come from the research so far is that there is an innate connection system, there is an innate approach system at this brainstem level, which is very close to the, the defensive response system, also the alarm system. So it means that people can have a conflict at the brainstem level if they've been ready to, to reach out to connect with somebody utilizing that innate connection system and then there's, for example, an angry response. So they get into a defensive response then almost simultaneously. So it means that you have a conflict at a brainstem level that by the time it gets up to consciousness may make no sense at all. So it's only when you really slow it down and look at it from the perspective of the brainstem anatomy and physiology that you can see the conflicted sequences at that level, and that allows a reorienting then to the conflict. So let me say that if I think about a recent experience I had when I was working with a client, is that she really want, has learned that underneath her conflictual experience, she really wants comfort. And as she's tried to reach out for comfort, and actually has been making good strides of that, what's also happening is all the way she pushes away love and comfort and care, the affiliative system, so she pushes that away, and she gets caught in that bind. And, and what you're saying is that by slowing it down and watching that, training her to not dissociate, but to stay yeah. right in that moment and just let it just shift a little, a little at a time, begins to remap itself, which is Fonagy's word for changing the attachment system. Yeah. And because the sequence goes from orienting to orienting tension to affect, where if we stay with the orienting and the orienting tension, we don't tend to get overwhelmed by the affect because mostly in other therapies, we're looking at the affect, we're looking at what is immediately distressing, what makes us viscerally uncomfortable. Mm -hmm. And that can lead to an intensification and an overwhelm if we're not resourced enough to be uh, with that. People dissociate more or they get more reactive. So if we stay instead with the first part of the sequence, then it's possible to go into the affect without dissociating or becoming dysregulated through being more reactive. And that, I think, is a major strength of, of this approach. 
I agree. Um, I think the other thing that has been helpful is training people to slow down and enter that body state so they can shift out of thinking about it and actually training themselves to be with and trust that bottom-up processing, which most people, I think, don't trust. And I think if we're starting from an experience that's distressing, if people have had very adverse experiences early in life, then the tendency would be to be disembodied, to, to dissociate from it. But because we start with orienting to a trigger, for example, to the angry face, to use the example from earlier, because we are starting with the orienting, it is safer to be in the body, to be aware of the tension that comes from that orienting before the affect comes in. Mm. See how beautifully you articulate it, Frank. Thank you. <laughs> it's, uh, good questions help. <laughs> yeah. Well, Frank, I am thrilled that you're coming and that people will have a chance to explore this more in depth and to find out more about the work that you're doing and how they can both change themselves and work with their clients to change.